years is recognized by the AIA and those of you who are um, members of AIE will receive upon completion a certificate of completion saying you attended this program. Those of you who are not AIE members but who desire to get this certificate, if you haven't filled out the form uh, to uh, enter the program, please let us know and we'll make sure that you get that certificate. Also, each attendee uh, will receive one learning unit related to the AIA CES program. Well, we're going to be talking about BIM and thinking about BIM a little bit, uh, going back to the day when, when the company I worked for first got into it, 2007. At that time, there was a 28% adoption rate in the industry for going into BIM, as published by, published by the McGraw-Hill. In 2012, that jumped to two. Th I'm sorry, that jumped to 71 percent. Many reasons for that, which we will be discussing shortly. But this webinar is designed to help set the stage for architects and contractors who are contemplating going into or implementing BIM within their firms. Meeting the AIA CES format, there are four learning objectives. The first learning objective is that course attendees upon completion will be able to descri describe why there is such a move to BIM and what are the key drivers making this happen. Attendees will be able to communicate how BIM is currently being applied in the construction industry and being used by architects and main contractors. Attendees will be able to envision the impact of BIM on the design process its opportunities, and the issues that are related to BIM. And finally, they'll be able to focus on the tools and terminology that are in use today. There are seven main objectives to meet those learning goals. First and foremost, we're going to define BIM. Every specialized uh, discipline these days has a common language and this is true in BIM. So we're going to take a quick look at some of the language that's being used today and help you get a better feel uh, of what is happening in the world of BIM. We're going to step back from BIM a moment and we're going to take a look at what's driving this surge uh, in BIM implementation. We're going to take a look at how it's being used in construction today what impact it's had in the overall construction process. And with anything that's new and different, there are always issues that need to be looked at before we move forward. And assuming you're at the executive level in your firm or you are the one making the decision to go forward in BIM, at the end of this session, we will provide you with what we think is a path towards BIM, the steps you should take or your firm in moving into the world of BIM. First and foremost, the definition, this is given to us by the National Building Information Standards Committee, and I'm going to simply read it. A digital representation of physical and functional characteristics of a facility, a BIM is a shared knowledge resource for information about a facility forming a reliable basis for decisions throughout its life cycle defined from earliest conception to demolition. Well, let's step back a little bit and think about that. When I graduated from school so many years ago, my first job was a drafts person. Remember those? Uh, I was so good at it that uh, they kicked me off the drafting board and moved me into executive management. But from that experience and following experiences, it really became ingrained in me the power of the digital or the graphic image. I used to joke about if you want to get an architect to stop talking, you take the pencil out of their hand because we spent so many hours on their boards with onion skin papers sketching potential solutions to design problems. That was the way we communicated. So when I first see a digital representation, an image, I get excited because I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be 3D and I no longer have to design in 2D and just kind of imagine what it's going to be in 3D. When I deal in 3D from a design standpoint, that opens up all new 
uh, avenues for me or for the architect or for the designer. But the second sentence is even more important. It's more than just that 3D image. It's a shared knowledge resource for information. Think of that detail and combine it with a database of information that are tightly linked. And then take that database and information and have it available to all those that are adding the design table or part of the design team. Sharing that information. Plus, the last concept that I think is important is the fact that it takes you from that first earliest design conception. Maybe it's that cocktail napkin detail you drew um, talking with your client about a proposed design solution that they wanted. And it takes it and it grows with that and it becomes more sophisticated as you add knowledge to the point you can hand it off to your client and then they use it for operations, facility management, management, and then eventually tearing it down. There are several things I want to uh, want you to leave with today, and this is probably the first and foremost. If you're thinking that you want to take your firm into a BIM environment, the first item that I want to to teach you or to tell you is, don't think of it as simply walking across the street to your favorite software vendor store, picking off uh, a BIM software package off the shelf, bringing it back to your office, installing it on your computer and saying, now I am BIM efficient. It's much, much more than that, which seems a little intimidating, but the power that you will see when you get there is, is worth the effort. I love this graphic that you see in the lower corner. It's given to us by um, an association out of the United Kingdom, and it really relays the importance of having the combined effect, the intermeshing of technology, people, process, all working together in that BIM environment. So if you're an executive, you must be willing to embrace a new technology, empower your people to go this little different direction in terms of technology, and then establish a new process which empowers people to even go further. So it's much, much more than simply installing software on a PC. A little bit more down to earth, what you're looking at in that graphic, there's my 3D graphic. It's of a cold form steel assembly. You see some details there. Now think beyond what the BIM has, and it has that information database that's supplied with that. So we have the digital representation with its ensuing information, and then we put it at the hub of information. So you see those blue circles. And in a BIM environment, in an integrated model, where all people can openly share concepts, thoughts, designs. You have the ability to share this information with your client, the architect, the engineer, structural engineer, consultant, specialty contractor, general contractor, and the building product manufacturer. They have a lot of input as well. So that is part of the power of, of BIM. Talking a little bit about the common language. There are only four I'm going to go into. I'm not going to go into a great depth in BIM in general. We're just going to give you the superficial uh, top layer vision of what BIM could be for you. And four key items I think you should know is one is, one is clash detection. And going back to my days in school, we used to laugh about designing um, an industrial space. You have an office building, and in that office building, you have a door to get outside. You make it a left-hand swing door. All is good. You build it. You open the door. You step out, and you step out right on a conveyor belt that's doing 100 feet per minute. Yeah, it sounds kind of funny. It sounds kind of hokey. But in reality, that happens every day in modern construction, and, and typically, you have to excuse me, I'm extremely myopic. I look at walls, I look at walls only in terms of all the building systems that are within a building. But if, if you build my wall and, and I don't have the, the ability to, or enough clear space on both sides of that wall to properly install the gypsum panels 
or install the studs themselves, all of a sudden I've got a problem and I can't guarantee you you're going to get the fire performance, the acoustical performance. I need a clear space on both those sides of that wall to make sure I install it properly. Same thing is true with the other building systems. If I'm talking about ductwork or if I'm talking about plumbing runs, I've got to have clear space around it to make it do its thing. In the old days, we would look at a set of drawings, we would overlay it with the architecturals, the mechanicals, and the structural, and say, yeah, it looks good. And we wouldn't find out we had a problem until we went to the job site. Nowadays, using this digital representation of the model that is extremely precise, we can see immediately where we're going to have the, quote, clash detection, where we're going to have problem areas where it, what um, where the systems just won't operate. You know it before you build it. Another message that I want to convey is, is part of the power of BIM is we all know that designing and building a structure is a one-off product. You have one shot to get it right and usually you're correcting it on the fly on the job site. Using BIM technology, you actually build it twice. You build it virtually Consider that a shakedown cruise, get everything that might be a potential problem out of the way, and then you build it. That's clash detection. LOD, that's level of detail. There are several definitions that are out there. One is coming from the uh, architectural community. One has come from the general contractor. But think of that first statement I said, that the BIM follows conception through operation. And so what the LOD does is take that segment of time and status and divide it into five chunks or levels of development. So the very basic is conceptual. At the very end, it's basically as-built details or as-built model to hand off to your uh, client. Interoperability. Back around 2004, 2005, I, I went to Washington, D.C., and I sat in a meeting of NIBS, the Consultative Committee on Construction, or something to that effect. And then the chairman of the committee at that time made a statement. He goes, the single biggest problem facing construction today is, gave that little bit of pause, at which time I was going through my mind, all the things I could think of that I knew as being problems, and he said interoperability, and I just, I had no clue. I'd never heard that term before, um, so I ran back to Chicago, sat in my office, did some research, and interoperability is huge. It was very huge back then. It's still an issue today, not something you need to worry about for you to really get into the uh, BIM world, but basically, in a nutshell, is it's, I'm a PC you're a Mac, we just don't talk to each other. So if the software I buy uh, from a BIM standpoint is doesn't function well with a contractor if I'm an architect or if it doesn't uh, form, conform well with the structural engineer on the project, we have issues and sometimes files are corrupted as you make that tra file transfer, things get distorted. That's interoperability. It also goes if, if, let's say I'm a contractor and I have a lot of software packages within my firm I use for, for various functions, accounting and estimating and so on and so forth. If they don't talk to the BIM package that I've got, then, then that's a problem for me. There's a lot of work going on. You're going to hear a lot more about interoperability uh, down the road. I uh, wouldn't make it a deal breaker, but it's just something you need to bear aware, be aware of. The last item is parametric modeling, a and you can think of it this way. It's, it's that digital representation, which includes the knowledge, uh, the information, and the, the graphic representation, and the ability of going in that model and changing one element within that model and you immediately see the ramifications of that change. Closest I can come to it in my Epic world is I design a building that I, I'm going to use 4 inch um, 15 mil studs for my walls, 24 inches on center, I go through the design phases, my engineer contract comes back and say, guess what, you need 6 inch 54 mil studs in that location and they have to be, by the way, 16 inches on center. Well, in a BIM model, I can put that information in and immediately see where I've got all my problems. It 
throat openings and so on and so forth. But that's parametric modeling. I can't underscore this enough, the power of BIM. The I in BIM is information. Years ago, uh, when, when we were building that website for a uh, design tool for architects and contractors, our team was sitting around the table one evening and, and kind of chatting and I had one gentleman uh, graduate of the School of Architecture at Georgia Tech and amazing guy, always quick with the witticism, very thoughtful. And we were talking about information and how many clicks it would take for an end user to get to the information they, they wanted. So we came up with three simple statements that are they're really kind of funny in a way, but they are so telling. Information is king, he said. Access to information is kinger. Speed to information is kingest. And yeah, we kind of chuckled about that and we thought about it and it's perfect. And that is exactly what's going on with BIM, which we'll talk a little bit more later on. But information is king. Because of this information, there is more than one dimension that is embedded within the BIM model. The first, of course, is that 3D image, that spatial information uh, that you will get from the graphical representation. But beyond that, because of the information that's embedded in that model, we can start to get a feel for the fourth D, which is scheduling. How long is it going to take me to, to erect the structure? And then five, the fifth D is cost. We can start to get a handle on how much this structure is going to cost me, all embedded within the BIM. Moving on now to LOD. Uh, this is a page taken off the 2014 level of development specification uh, as put out by BIM Forum, which is um, an organization with the general contracting community. They have a specification out that clearly defines what those five levels are. The AIA has one as well. Uh, they're close, but they're different. They both have five levels. They both have it in series of 100. So there's a 100, a 200, a 300, a 400, and the AIA has the 500. Think of that 500 as the as-builts. But as you can see here in this illustration, I have a concept for a wall. I need a wall. I know I need a wall. I'm not quite sure what it's going to be. That's that level 100. Well, I know more. I've gotten more information. I know how that door is going to, or that wall is going to function. I'm going to have to put a door in it. So I'm starting to clarify that wall. We get to 300, and all of a sudden we're starting to see the materials that will be used in this wall. Again, more information coming in, the clearer the picture gets. Level 350, now we're starting to see the structural components that are needed to make that wall stand up. And one piece of advice I wanted to share with you too is if you're thinking about getting started in a BIM environment, uh, I would strongly recommend reaching out to your favorite building product manufacturers. They have done a lot of research, expend a lot of resources, become experts in this arena, and they have a lot, a lot of them have um, libraries available for you just to help you get started down the path. And they all operate generally in that 350 category. Moving on to 400, oh, I can start to see, I know what that wall is now. Personally, I'm not too happy because I see it's a, um, uh, reinforced masonry wall, but you start to get the idea. We've taken it from conception through structural to the detailing in the level 400. Let's walk that through a little bit more, and we're going to look at the three and the four and the five. Level 100, you just left your client's office. He's told you he wants a hospital. It's going to be 300 beds. He's giving you the size of the lot. He wants it to be a signature building. He's giving you his OPR um, owner project requirements. you got a pretty good idea what you need to do and where to get started, but you haven't really put, excuse the word, pen to paper to come up with the design. Spatially, it's, it's a schematic wall, thinking of, of myopic wall again. There are no details. Scheduling, mm, it really broad terms, nothing really there. Cost estimating, mm, just a guess at this point in time. I get to level 200. I now have it in a 3D object. 
So I get a feeling for the thickness, the composition, the location, but things could be tweaked as I get more information. I may have to play with that model a little bit more. Because I know the materials, I get a good feel for the scheduling. I can get a little harder figure on quantities and duration. Cost estimating, you can think of that LOD uh, 100. If it's a hospital, you probably have a pretty good ballpark figure on cost per bed, and that's really all you have. But at this point, at 200, you're starting to develop quantities of walls, and you can start to measure it, and you can start to quantify it. Level 300, oh, okay, now I get it. I'm going to have gypsum board on these walls. It's going to be a one-hour wall, 50 STC, which means I need three layers of drywall. Uh, looks like I'm going to be using a three and five-eighths inch, uh, let's say 30 mil studs, 16 inches on center. I'm really starting to build information into the model. Because I have that information, I can really get a good feeling for scheduling it as well as I can start to get unit pricing on it. You'll notice too here, excuse me, you can notice too, I've, I've included down in the corner, there's that um, information model. And you're sharing this in the integrated model. All interested parties have that information, can provide input, and help massage the final design solution. Going to 350, so we are in cold form steel framing, it appears, and we have kickers, we have jam studs, we have some sort of headers, there's tracks. I have a pretty good feel for what's going on. This is the level of information that you're going to get, by the way, from your uh, building product manufacturer. This is what they'll be able to help you with. A lot of information at that point. Moving on to four. Oh, okay. I can see now I need back blocking location. For some reason I need clip angles uh, where the stud hits a runner track. Uh, I should bring out is everything in BIM is evolving. These images are, are not SFIAs. They are from BIM form. Um, Personally, I've never seen a cold form steel framed assembly look like this, but uh, it's an evolutionary process. We'll work with them and, and get it so it's more realistic. But the point I'm trying to make is we're at LOD 400. From a contractor standpoint, I can start thinking about how I'm going to put this together. Is there some commonality of details that I can think of that I can prefabricate pieces? Can I panelize portions of it? This really helps me hone in on the scheduling as well as give a good hard figure on the cost of those walls. Stepping back again, what's driving this bus called BIM? Everybody knows we're coming out of that great recession. And, and I recall talking to architects, so 2010, 2011, and these were executives of firms and, and they were relating, you know, it really was a tough haul. We really had to go down to a skeleton crew and, and uh, we survived. But you know what? As much as I hate to admit it, Um, kind of like this working lean and maybe a little hard pressed to expand staffing a little bit. Beyond that, look at the contractor side. There's been this, this lean construction trend and that's all driven on efficiencies, doing more with less and there's whole theories behind it. What's all driving that? Well, it's, it's reduction in workforce. And, and all the efficiencies that that can actually derive. The next item, information is king, but it's lacking. Let's go back in time 35 years ago. I'm a young gentleman out in the streets of Chicago. I'm calling on architects and contractors. And I, in that marketplace, are the go-to person in the industry if you want to know anything about material properties of the products I sell, the performance properties, the building science that supports them. I'm the guy to go to. I'm not patting myself on the back, well, maybe a little bit, but there was a whole army of us out there. That's what we did for a living. That was our charge in life. And our best friend was who? Was a construction specifier. We would go to him. He talks the same language as we do. 
we would share the information that each other needed. I needed project information to send my sales team. He needed product information for his project architect on a project. I would give that to him. I'd help him work through design solutions. Fast forward 35 years, both of us are gone. We're not in the industry anymore. Further, the, the way we built buildings 35 years ago is nowhere near the way they are today. The complexities of construction now far outweigh what they were in the past. We have IECC 2012, we have ASHRAE 189.1, we have LEED, sustainability. Uh, regulations are much more stricter. The need for information is paramount. Further look at it, there has been tremendous pressure on reducing the design time. Coming somewhat from the owners, they want to get that revenue stream generating to get their ROA in their buildings. So they're putting a lot of pressure on design firms. Let's get this baby out the door and built so I can make money. However, that's coupled with the knowledge that any design changes that occur after DT, DDs occur in CDs or in bid or heaven forbid in under construction has an exponential cost increase if that same design change occurred during design development. So there's a lot of pressure to reduce that design time but there's also that huge gamble that if we don't get it right now, we've got serious problems down the road. Well, it's like the perfect confluence. We have the need for information, the speed of delivery, and then you couple it with a tool called BIM. BIM is the I is information. So now we have the information that we need when we need it, and we can reduce the design time, we can get all parties through a collaborative process together and that takes us to from design bid build to design build to design assist to IPD, the integrated process. BIM facilitates that. Let's take a look, quick walk through the construction and design process and see how BIM is being used. We're going to look at DDs, then we're going to move into bid, and then we're going to finally look at build. In design development, that's the time for proving your design concept. It's the time for looking at alternates. It's the time to establish the architect's budget. Going into bid, it's, it's where the contractor gets a chance at it and hopefully not the first time, but they get a chance to look at it and there, explore their alternates and then establish their timelines, which are critical for, for the quick completion of the project. Then we move into build and the cost impacts based on BIM and how to increase the uh, quality within the project itself. How is BIM being used in DDs and design development? 3D proves that design concept. You build the building twice. You build it the first time in a virtual concept and now you can pull out your color crayons if you want and start changing things with no cost impact. You can make it a, a linear building, you can make it curvilinear, you can use glass bandrels, you can use brick veneer, you can use stucco, you can use concrete, you can go from Oh, you can do any kind of floor layout you want to think of. You can look at it then and there. It's fast, it's efficient, and you get the information you need right then to make some good informed decisions. Hopefully the building has been designed around cold form steel framing, but let's say the client wants you to take a look at, well, let's look at wood framing. What's that going to do to the project? Or masonry, or port in place concrete. I'm not going to say it's as simple as a flip of the switch, but you can quickly go through those design scenarios and come back with an informed decision that you can readily make. One of the key items in DDs is, is the architect's budget. That is essentially the green light for that project to proceed. And the more accurate that architect's budget is, the happier everybody will be down the road. Well, BIM facilitates that in terms of that fifth and fourth D 
D or a dimension, it helps give you the framing costs on a per square foot basis or linear foot basis, whatever um, you would need. Bid. The model is completed. Typically, it's done to an LOD 200. It's tossed over the fence to the general contractor, which in itself is a little bit of a problem because the power of BIM is that integrated model where you only have one model. But in this case, which is more common these days, is the contractor gets it. He starts building his model, his virtual solution to the building, and he can look at things and exploring alternates that he's aware of and establish scheduled baselines for completion. Now is the time for, let's say, the framing contractor to took a, take a look at that element that I showed you earlier and start to think about things like, well, what happens if I go with um, 33 mil in, instead of 54 mil? Is there a way that I can eliminate those kickers? They cost a lot of money. They take a lot of time. Um, can I play with the spacing of the framing? There are some proprietary cold form steel frame systems out there that could prove very, very effective and cost efficient. Here's a time for them to play with it. Build it in a model first. Some contractors use this time to, to evaluate their solution and then use it, let's say, as a marketing tool to make a proposal back to the design team. This is what I think you should do. And immediately you can see the graphic representation as well as a solid cost information and scheduling the impacts of that alternate. Now is also the time for the contractor to look for those clash detections. Where are going to be my problem areas? Where am I going to fight for clearance for the, the uh, utility runs or the uh, walls themselves? Again, looking and thinking only of, of that part of the business. I can start to coordinate the trades a little bit. I can establish the critical walls, the ones that have to go first, the framing elements that have to go first. And that's a fairly significant issue in any construction project is who goes first? The BIM model is being used to do that. Okay, we've designed it. We've bid it. We're now under construction and we're going to look at how BIM is being used to control cost and how it's being used to uh, increase quality. Simply put, from a control cost standpoint, it's the right material at the right place at the right time. That material has already been vetted many times. We know it's the right material. The schedule is telling me it's the right time. And, and I know from the model the right place. So from a contractor standpoint, I'm doing a 30-story building on the 24th floor. I know there's going to be a three-hour wall. It's going to require six layers of board, three on each side. We're going to be looking at 54 mil studs, mm, 25 feet long. They're going to be 12 inches on center. This is going to force me to go with my best team the guys that are most skilled putting together that type of wall. But having that information up front, I can get the right crew at the right place and the right time. And then the final bullet point there is simply saying, if you build the building twice, if you build it first as a model, what you see is what you get. There, it's managing expectations. There's no surprises. Let's look at quality assurance and quality control. I've had several contractors tell me the single biggest attribute for using BIM is quality control. Because now you can take that digital representation right off the PC, take it to the job trailer, put it on a tablet, run it out to the concrete slab using layout and robotics. That wall is going exactly where it's supposed to be. It's the exact thickness it's supposed to be. And everything is known up front before you start shooting track. That alone is a huge boost um, to quality control. It also relates to having that information up front resolves the issue of RFIs, reduces them. So how much we'll, we'll see in a minute impact on the construction process. 
that little diagram in the corner there is the design process, not the construction process. And basically it's telling you, you have a design problem, you think it through, you come up with a potential design solution, you test it, you build it, you implement it, you modify it, it becomes a little iterative as you go through the process. But now think of that as this one-off building I'm doing. And, and it's not just one individual, it's multiple individuals, each with a high level of expertise in what they're doing or they wouldn't be on the job. And think of the power that that brings. So we have collaboration. We have flow of information. You wouldn't have had that to this extent if you weren't using a BIM. Plus, you're building the building twice. You're proving constructability before you build it. And finally, thinking of a cost standpoint, you're reducing RFIs, you're cleaning up a lot of inefficiencies. We're not promoting necessarily that you have this collaboration, that everybody now is part of the design team, and you sit in this huge office with everybody sitting around the table, inputting their, their thoughts and suggestions in the final solution. But what we are saying is, um, through an electronic medium, we now have the ability to connect the design team with consultants, contractors, specialty contractors. So let's say we have a wall and we know it's going to have to be meet IECC 2012, let's say, and it's going to have to be moisture resistant and it's going to have to be so tall. So the design team is scratching their head. They bring in a consultant on sustainability, get their advice. We get it, bring in the contractor and the specialty contractor, the guy who's going to do the framing and install the panels, they all can confirm and come up with a solution that's best for the project, working together as a team. That's collaboration. And that all happens because of the free flow of information in an open platform in a BIM environment. So everybody, if they need to, can have a say. Build the building twice. It's no longer a one-off product. We build it the first time in the model, and then we execute it in uh, steel studs and gypsum panels in the real world afterwards. It's a shakedown cruise. Extremely important. Some contractors tell me that they build this model. They'll bring in their own team as soon as they get the bid, and they'll bring in the, the um, field superintendent, the mechanic that's actually going to be installing the material, bring in the estimator, the engineer, project manager, and sit down in a, in a room and build it once on the screen where everybody has input. And that's a learning experience for everybody. And it's important to possibly go through this process. And if you come with something unique and different, then you have this model as a tool to work with the design team to make your proposal to do it this particular way, if it's supposed to be that way. But the virtual model prior to construction is extremely important and really a strong part of that impact of BIM. I talked a little bit about RFIs earlier. Um, two quotes here. One is from the Contractor's Guide to BIM First Edition and simply stated, it's a statement, RFIs will significantly reduce during field construction because of that 3D. Well, the proof of that is in the next bullet point, which is a survey that was recently conducted by Dodge, and three quarters of the respondents, almost three quarters of the respondents, of which were design team and contractors, gave BIM a medium, high, or very high rating on BIM's impact on RFI reduction. Well, let's try and quantify that a little bit more. This is uh, a spreadsheet that was provided by the Science and Education Publishing. And if you look around the center, you're going to see requests for information. You can see a little bit more hardcore numbers, 34 to 43% reduction. That is significant. Change orders, I really haven't talked about those, but they are um, a big money hog as well as an efficiency robber down the road. And you can see... 40% reduction, nor have we talked about ROI, and if you're the executive of your firm and you're thinking about BIM, you need to pay attention to these figures because you're seeing uh, reported an ROI of a minimum 16.2%. 
definitely an analysis you need to go through. You need to go through, uh, as a firm, how does BIM fit into your organization? How does it fit into your marketplace? Who of your construction partners are already using BIM and how will that influence them if you come online with the BIM model? But bottom line, you're going to have to look at it from ROI. Part of the, the process of deciding to go into BIM. Here's some of the issues, at least ones that we've heard of somewhat anecdotally, if you will. The design model is coming into the contractor a little bit too level, too low level of detail. AIA and, and the standard is to come in with a LOD 200 for bid. And contractors will say, you know what, that's just not enough information. The BIM models are not that accurate currently. Uh, studs won't go up to deck. They won't show the right size of studs. And it's not the architect. It's kind of a limitation of the model at that level. Admittedly, contractors are responsible for means and methods. So a lot of that responsibility falls to them already. But it would be certainly more helpful if that LOD was a little bit more uh, in-depth, a little bit more information provided at that level. The next item is cost of entry. This isn't cheap. You have hardware requirements, you have software requirements, you have training requirements, how you're going to handle it, all have a price tag associated with it. And many feel at this point in time it's just too much for their firm to swallow. Certainly something that you need to take a look at and see how it fits into your um, business model. Also, I said before, and I've been alluding to, the integrated model. The integrated model, as I said before, is that model that starts in concept and is the same model all the way through to the as-built. In the real world, that doesn't always happen. Maybe rarely does it happen, where you, typically you have the design model and then you have contractor model or the construct model. Hopefully, they interface seamlessly. But sometimes there's a conflict in there, and that has to be resolved. Anything in our society, any change in our society, has the potential for increased legal exposure. And you need to look through this for your firm and see how it fits. Typically, um, it has to deal with the data, who owns it, how reliable is the data, and if you make a suggestion in a BIM model that's incorporated as a function of time, you have to be careful because you may end up becoming designer of record. Um, you have to, there's some protocols that you need to follow. The AIA has a really good program um, and a guide spec, I'm sorry, not guide specification, contract that helps guide architects through that um, confusion of that. So. Not a deal breaker. We always have litigation. We always have legal exposure. It's just something that's a little bit different. We need to know our new boundaries. Path to BIM. You've listened to me. You've listened to others. And you decided as an executive, now is the time to take my firm into the BIM environment. What we suggest you do, one, develop a business plan. Two, Delegate a team within your firm. Three, due diligence. Do some research on software and hardware requirements and what best fits your firm. Looking in that graphical image, make sure that you integrate the process totally in your firm and not just uh, hire a college grad, give them a, a laptop or a computer, and then lock them in a closet. And then fully instruct the team on how to use BIM. Looking at each one of those, develop the business plan. Look at your marketplace. Look at the key players in your marketplace and how you interface with them now. Where do you want to be in five years? What systems do they use? What systems don't they use? What's important to you and where do you want to position your business for the future? What kind of ROI can you, can you live with as you get started? To me, this all points to a top-down type of operation. It could come either bottom-up, someone that's really passionate about BIM within the firm, but eventually it's got to turn around and be top-down. Management has to buy into it. They have to develop the business plan to move forward, and it has to 
uh, include a strategic plan for positioning your, uh, your firm for the future. And to do that, of course, you need to establish goals, benchmarking, accountability, all the standard things you do when you come up with a business plan, keeping in mind you're dealing with technology, people, and process. Next time, delegate a team. Don't create little silos within your firm of estimating engineering, uh, if you're an architect, a contracting firm, the BIM guy. Um, if you're an architect, it's it's the the architect, the job captain, and design team. Integrate it. Get them all used to that BIM environment. So it's management, it's staff, and it's field. Architectural site construction administration, possibly. Do your due diligence on your software. There, there's so much software that's out there, it can be somewhat intimidating, but it doesn't have to be. Do some research, talk to people, it's probably the easiest answer. Find out what they're using, find out what works, find out what doesn't work, some ideas of people to talk to, talk to associations, organizations, talk to the software vendors themselves. They are very willing and they're looking for the opportunity to talk to you, provide you training if you want it, and so on and so forth. Talk to your building product manufacturers. They've done a lot of research. They can help you with a little market research on software and hardware. Possibly one of the biggest decisions you have going forward is, do you want to rent the technology or do you want to buy the technology? By that I mean is, do you want to build in-house expertise, staff it, get the software, get the hardware, or do you want to outsource it? There are a lot of firms out there that you can just hand off the 2D documents, give it to them, they'll come back in short order with your BIM model complete. Either way works, each has pros and cons, you have to figure out which one is best for your firm. Some firms use a balance of both, but it's something you need to think about and, and think through the issues revolved. And keep in mind, above all, it's not software off the shelf, installed in machine, close the door, I'm in a BIM environment, have a nice day. It's the combination of technology, people, and process working together. So you need to integrate it. You need to think about how your firm is operating. Um, you may find out that once you get in the BIM environment that you do things differently in sequencing. Instead of what might be in the old days, ready, fire, aim, you don't have a lot of time to put a bid together. So you, you take a shot at it thinking about what it might be. But in a BIM environment, it's more like ready, aim, fire. You got the information when you need it, and now you can build it, but you have to turn your process around to make it happen. Instruct that team I was talking about, and that includes the management, the staff, and the field. Teach them about your process, get their input on the process, get them involved in the technology, make sure they understand technology. If you're going to outsource, make sure at least someone in your firm can at least talk the BIM language. And then finally, train everybody on those new boundaries uh, imposed by uh, litigation and liability. This pretty much concludes my presentation. Um, we've defined BIM. We've talked a little bit about com common language. We've talked about what drives this bus called BIM, why it's happening now how it's being used in the construction industry and in design, in bid, and in construction, what impact it has on the construction process, the design process, the issues that you need to be aware of when you're thinking about going into BIM, and then finally we talked about a little bit of a pathway to take you in the direction if you choose to go into a BIM environment. This concludes the formal presentation uh, for on behalf of SFIA. Um, I thank you very much for listening in on this and there's my contact information if you want to drop me a note and, and ask me any questions. Um, thank you very much.